Hi, everyone. Welcome to the China interviews section of the program. Uh, this is the first in a series of three interviews with uh, some experts from China in the scholarly research and publishing sectors. Uh, I think that these are, while they're, while they're not new voices in China, they may be new voices to some of you. And um, I'm very, very excited and grateful that uh, to have their, their time and contributions to this session. So, and I hope you will all enjoy it. Today, we have um, a former colleague of mine, Judy Bai, who uh, has worked in scholarly publishing at Elsevier and Nature, and thus is in a great position to comment on the reform, the Ch STM uh, publishing reforms in China. But she's also uh, been working a more recently at digital science. So she has expertise on the publishing platform or the technology side of things as well. Uh, so I think she's in a great position to kick off this this first of these three sessions. Um, so I'd like to ask Judy to join if you can unmute Judy. Thanks, Nico. Uh, and thanks Hello, again everyone. so much for taking the time to join us today. So I think um, today, again, the, the focus of today is about China's STM publishing reforms and developing their own STM industry. And just by way of introduction, I think it's worth noting that China has had similar initiatives in the past aimed at building up more uh, international, an, a larger international portfolio of STM journals in 2015, 2016. But this effort, which dates from some reforms published in 2019 and then the launch of the China Journal Excellence Action Plan last year, it's different, I think, in its scope and in its size. Uh, so it, 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 merits, it merits our attention. And we'll be, we'll be focusing on that today. Um, by way of background, prior to this, this conference, we actually had a, a pre-conference webinar where we invited attendees, a researcher to reader attendees, to submit some questions to us. Judy is going to kick off the interview with a bit of an overview of the STM sector that incorporates uh, these questions and answers to them. We will then touch on a few more of those before opening up the floor to questions from the audience members today. So uh, you can submit your questions in the chat. Uh, the Honorable Phil Jones is helping to produce this session and will be uh, looking through your questions and then forwarding them on to me. So with that, Judy. Thanks, Nico. Uh, hello, everyone. It's good to be with you. I'm very glad to have this opportunity to participate this session today. So as you can tell from Nico's introduction, I have been engaged in academic publishing in China in the past 15 years and started with Elsevier, managing a portfolio of international journals in the area of biotechnology. Um, so I learned about the international approach of running journals, for example, the journal registration system in the market economy, um, clear division of labor, a well-developed production chain, high efficiency and elaborated, elaborated procedures of quality guarantee. And then I moved on to the former Nature Publishing Group where I led the Chinese Partnership Journal Program. So that was a small and nice group of 20 English language STM journals published in collaboration with Chinese universities and CAS institutes. So the majority of those journals are selected by the journal initiative launched by CAS, which um, Nicole just mentioned. So I can safely say that they represent the most elite journals in China. And I am fortunate enough to have witnessed the not so easy journey of many partnerships and also made my own contribution along the way. Um, before we dive into the specific questions, so I thought it would be useful to share with you a few facts and figures, which would help you gain a quick overview of the Chinese STM journal landscape. Um, instead of giving you a lot of dry numbers that can be hard to absorb, so you just need to remember that there are three 90% that help define the characteristics of the current picture. We don't know how the future will look like, but it, it, it is how it looks today. Uh, so according to the Blue Book, um, China's Scientific Journal Development 2020, 
published by Science Press. By the year 2019, there are in total close to 5,000 STM journals in China. Uh, by the way, I highly recommend this blue book if you're looking for uh, fuller and deeper insights into the Chinese STM <laughs> journal market. Um, out of the 5,000 journals, 90% of them were launched after the year 1990. And out of the 5,000 journals, 90% of them are published in Chinese language. And out of the 300 English, purely English language journals, 90% are published in partnership with international publishers. So I think it's the last group of journals that are probably most relevant to our session today. And I'm sure you would agree that 90% is a very impressive result. And you might wonder when did it all start? Um, I think today we can all see that China's science has displayed extraordinary growth over the past three decades. But many international publishers already saw this coming 20 years ago, and they started establishing presence in China. So this means recruiting locally based publishing staff, myself included. And I remember the, the journal collaboration activities started around 2005, 2006. So interestingly, it is also around that time, China's paper output was catching up and was just about to come to the second place, surpassing the United Kingdom, Japan, and Germany. Um, so I don't know how many of you have had experience working with these Chinese journals, but if you do, I'm sure you would agree with me that these partnerships haven't been an easy pass for both sides. So there are a lot of reasons to that, of course, but my understanding is that one of the fundamental reasons is that um, Chinese journals are at complete different stages, or maybe I should say much earlier stages in terms of development and maturity compared to international ones. So like we just mentioned, 90% of those journals were only launched after the year 1990, so far behind the world. And so the reality is for these Chinese journals in those partnerships, they had to face up to the knowledge gap of how to run a journal with international standards. So from my personal experience, it, that is a fairly steep learning curve. Um, for foreign publishers, they needed to understand the already complicated and still evolving scientific publication system in China, and also find a way to work with these journals that operate under a state-controlled central administration. So along the journey, um, while these journals adopted the international approach in terms of um, editorial practice and production workflow, their editorial office gained publishing insights. And what's interesting is apart from cultivating these homegrown publishing expertise, there's also some impressive recruitment efforts. Or for example, the chief editor of Cell Research used to work at Cell Press and the director of publications at the Chinese Chemical Society used to work for ACS. But obviously this is not a one-way street. We also see uh, cell research editors now working for nature cell biology. So there's um, a lot of a healthy exchange of talents. <laughs> um, so foreign publishers of, uh, also benefited from this process. So they raised their profile for example, and also they built a wide network, network among the, the uh, administration and also the research community. Uh, more importantly, they managed to train up a group of Chinese publishing professional who have deep insights on both international publishing practice and local research economy. So this allows them to to better strategize in response to policy changes on topics such as research evaluation and open science trends. So let's not forget uh, the bigger background is that the R&D expenditure in China grew rapidly in the past two decades and shows no sign to stop. And domestic innovation is high up on the national agenda uh, in the 15th five-year plan. 
So 15 years later in 2021, we can see that these joint efforts started to bear fruit uh, with elite journals emerging from China, like cell research, um, nano research, uh, horticultural research. And now I realize that we need to be more creative with coming up with um, journal titles. Uh, but these journals are now considered top journals in their respective subject category. So what will the future look like? Um, so given that English language journals only account for 7% of all STM journals in China, that's 360 against 5,000. So in the next few years, we'll see more and more new English language journals being launched. Um, and also, if you have followed the recent science policy in China, you'll notice that there is a strong focus to promote quality in scientific publications um, and not mention the recent development of, of open access, which I personally believe is a good opportunity for new launches. So although the goals are quite amb ambitious and challenging, um, I do believe that we'll see more Chinese STM journals joining the League of Top Journals, particularly in the uh, research field that China has strengths in. Nicole. Thanks, Judy. By the way, you went a bit dark. I'm not sure if so there was a change Le in the lighting. Leaving office and shut off the light. Oh, OK. Um, can you wave your arm and get it to, or is that it? Uh, I can go out and turn on, but maybe. OK, well. Um, so uh, yes, that's the benefit of environmental, environmentally friendly offices, I suppose. There you go. Um, so, one of the, thank you so much for that. And that's, uh, I, I mean, I, I agree completely with all of the comments. Uh, I wanted to ask, as a result of this, there is going to be a shift. It's taking place. It's it's not, it's not going to happen this year. Maybe not even next year. But I think there is going to be a definitely definite change in the competitive dynamic for foreign publishers in China. One question, uh, I think a question that we had several times in the early session was, uh, chi is because China is putting this emphasis on publishing more high quality articles in its own journals, while there, there, there is a, there's a lot of output coming out, should publishers, foreign publishers of lower impact journals be worried? In China, do you think that they'll see a fall in submissions as there's more competition for these, for um, uh, Chinese submissions? Mm, I think it's the right move and also logical move for the government to come up with these policy uh, to shift the focus from counting publication output to stressing high quality research. So I'm I mentioned earlier that um, when these international publishers established presence in China, that was when China was just about to become the uh, second place in terms of paper output. Right. And now it's another critical time when we see that China is probably going to, or already has <laughs> surpassed the US in terms of paper output. But that's just by counting papers. So the yeah. next logical next step is obviously to focus more on quality. But um, like you just mentioned, there's not enough mm, uh, Chinese top journals in China. Uh, so there's definitely room for international publishers to play. And also mm, China is a massive country and it would take time for policy made at the top to trickle down to individual researchers for their decision making. So what I'm saying is there's still time for um, publishers to improve their relatively lower impact journals. Mm -hmm. Fix that. <laughs> yep. But that's the way that is, uh, that is a future direction is towards higher. If you want to thrive in China, it's probably going to have to be higher impact. That yeah. actually feeds into a question we just got from uh, Katrina McCallum at Hindawi. And um, I think we'll tackle this one together. She's asking how committed are Chinese Academy of Science and Chinese universities to changing the culture of evaluation and reward. And I think the, the definitive answer to that is they are definitely committed. I think there is some question as to how that is exactly being implemented because the guidance from the top is usually quite high level. But mm. I know from my work that we're seeing this shift away from just counting, as you say, numbers of papers 
And there are lots of uh, policy announcements at the university level and at Chinese Academy of Science level on focusing on quality of research, as well as other measures of, of accomplishment, like a, um, look, trying to better capture the contribution to society, the important of the research topic to national uh, goals, national strategic research goals, et cetera. Would you agree mm -hmm. with that? Yes, yes. And also, um, there are experiments or initiatives initiated by uh, university libraries, uh, like Peking University Library, Nanjing University Library, they, they also um, have a core list or uh, selected list of journals uh, mm -hmm. for um, ranking for Chinese journals. And um, I, among these lists, I would like to, I think it's worth mentioning the effort from CNKI, um, from, oh, I forgot the name, it's called World Academic Journal Impact Index. So in, in this initiative, they look at global scientific journals beyond uh, those indexed by Web of Science and Scopus. So it's an expanded list of uh, 15,000 journals, right. including 10,000 English journals and 5,000 Chinese journals. And, and also they plan to incorporate not only the traditional bibliometric indicators, but also uh, alternative indicators. Right. Yes, including altmetric. I, I noticed that. Is that yeah. That's also referred to, I think, as the World Ac Academic Journal Clout Index. Is that right? Maybe. Maybe you don't like that name. <laughs> no, I know. If you can supply the link, I'll be able to share it with people. Um, I can't believe I can't believe it, but our time is just about. I'm getting the signal that we have less than one minute, <laughs> and I have to hand over to Phil, um, who will be helping everybody with um, instructions on how to participate in the workshops. Uh, Judy, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for everybody who's attending, I will be at the networking session from 1 p.m and we'll do my best to answer any follow-on questions you have. And if there are questions I have that I can't answer and, and require Judy's expertise, I'll get in touch with her and I can connect with everyone tomorrow on that. Uh, Judy, again, thank you so much. I know it's thank late you. there. Appreciate your time and your preparation. Uh, Phil, I will hand it over to you now. Thanks, Nico. And thank you very much, Judy. That was an excellent and interesting conversation. So for the attendees, please, everybody, take a moment to rate and comment on this session in your participant survey. Um, at our next break at 1 p.m., Judy and Nico uh, may be available in the virtual networking session in the Great Hall for a while. So if you want to continue to the discussion, there's an opportunity to, to pick it up there. So the next thing that we have on our agenda is the workshops. So we have five workshops, and they're all going to run simultaneously in uh, in three meetings that span across the two days of the conference as shown in the program. So most of you should have been pre-allocated to a particular workshop. Um, if we, we've done the allocations based on a first and second choice on your regi on registering, but we've also aimed to, to create a balance of people within each group. So please stick to the workshop uh, to which you've been uh, assigned and allocated. Um, if you've not been assigned one, perhaps you registered a little bit late, um, please join either B, C, D or E. Please uh, don't join A because it's a little bit oversubscribed. Okay, so you join by going to the, uh, the workshop's agenda item in the timeline. So what I want everybody to do is go back to the timeline and you will see in the session information there is a box and it will have links. One of the links will be to the uh, to the virtual room. It's the same place that we did the networking in, and it's the workshop venue. Um, there will also be a link to an additional resource which is being used by your workshop. That could be a Google Doc, or it could be Menti, or it could be uh, or it could be something called Miro, which is a virtual canvassing board. And you'll see that when you join the group. So open them in two different browser tabs. Uh, they should automatically open in two different browser tabs, and you'll be able to uh, see everybody there. When you in the virtual rooms area on the left hand side, there will be a list of subrooms, and you'll be able to go between them. Please go to the first one allocated to your workshop. So if your workshop B, for example, go to workshop B room one, and you should meet your facilitator there and uh, good luck and have great workshops. And so we'll see you. We'll see you in there.